Shabbat Shalom. It is good to be here this morning. Uh, thankful for another Sabbath. If you would, let us go ahead and stand, and we're going to turn to Jeremiah. Sorry, I have to adjust this. There we go. So Jeremiah 4. Jeremiah 4. Jeremiah 4 and 14. O oh, Jerusalem, wash your heart from evil and be saved. Till when would your wicked thoughts remain within you? For a voice is declaring from Dan and is proclaiming trouble from Mount Ephraim. Announce to the nations, look, proclaim against Jerusalem that besiegers are coming from a distant land and raise their voice against the cities of Yehuda. Like keepers of a field that are against her all around, because she has rebelled against me, declares Yah. Your ways and your deeds have brought this upon you. This is your evil because it is bitter, because it has reached into your heart. O oh, my inward parts, my inward parts, I am in pain. O oh, the walls of my heart, my heart pounds in me. I am not silent, for you have heard, O oh, my being, the sound of the ram's horn, a shout of battle. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for all the land is ravaged. Suddenly my tents are ravaged, my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see a banner and hear the sound of the ram's horn? For my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. I looked at the earth and saw it was formless and empty and the Shemaim that had no light. I looked in the mountains and saw they shook and all the hills were swaying. I looked and saw there was no man and all the birds of the Shemaim had fled. I looked and saw the garden land was a wilderness and all its cities were broken down at the presence of Yah by his burning displeasure. For thus said Yah, all the earth shall be a ruin, but I shall not make a complete end. On account of this, let the earth mourn and the Shemaim above be dark because I have spoken, because I have purposed and shall not relent, nor do I turn back from it. All the city is fleeing from the noise of the horsemen and the bow archers. They shall go into bushes and climb up on the rocks. All the city is forsaken and no one is dwelling in it. And when you are ravaged, what would you do? Though you put on crimson, crimson, though you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, though you enlarge your eyes with paint, you adorn yourself in vain. Your lovers despise you. They seek your life. For I have heard a voice as of a woman in labor and distress as of her who brings forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion. She bewails herself, she spreads out her hands, saying, Woe to me, for my being faints because of murderers. Let us lift up our eyes. Yah, thank you for this day that you have given us, Yah. Thank you for your word, Yah. You are so good to us. No matter what happens in our lives, Yah, you are in control of all things. We just lift you up on high and keep us in preserve us, Yah. Speak for yourself. Speak unto the hearts of the people, Yah. We have so much to learn. May we just humble ourselves before you, Yah. Just keep us and preserve us. Uh, we know your word. Your word is within us. Strengthen us by that, Yah, we pray. Lead God and direct us. Baruch Hashem. Hallelujah. Amen. So some pretty interesting points on this. Uh, I do want to get into this first. There was a pretty good thought that I heard this week about uh, Hasatan, uh, the deceiver or the uh, adversary, not deceiver, the adversary, uh, and how the adversary is actually uh, the evil inclination. And that is what is within you that leads you astray. Everyone will be judged and the righteous will be judged the fact that they did not listen to the evil inclination. And then you have the wicked that will be judged and will be in shame to the point they said, I let such a little thing control my life. Their evil inclination, which means the, the ability to do evil, the incitement to do evil, the desire to do evil. And I'm like, that's a pretty good thought. So when he talks about Job and Hasatan, that was the evil inclination that was in Job that was fighting against him. And I'm like, wow, that's some cool stuff because it is all within us. It is within you to want to do evil. Not that you can't subdue that, even as Yah talked to Cain, he said that it is at your door, it is crouching, but you have the ability to rule over it. So you don't have to let it overtake you. You have the ability, the God-given talent, the God-given ability to 
forsake evil. And it talks about uh, in Proverbs, the one who would choose good forsake evil if you want to reverence Yah. So that's the beginning this morning. Now, in Jeremiah, we are talking about um, what will happen because of sin. But there's a point that we really want to get into in verse 22, but we'll read through this again. So Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 14. Oh, Jerusalem, wash your heart from evil and be saved till when would your wicked thoughts remain within you? So you've got to be washed on the inside. OK, uh, evil comes from within. Uh, I've also heard that happiness comes from within. It is a choice that you make every day, whether you're going to let evil thoughts corrupt who you are and give in to them. So he said, wash your heart from evil and be saved till when would your wicked thoughts? Because that's what the heart is. It's your intentions. It's your thoughts. What are you thinking about? Are you going to act upon that? So wash your heart from evil and be saved till when would your wicked thoughts remain within you? For a voice is declaring from Dan is proclaiming trouble from Mount Ephraim, announce to the nations, look, proclaim against Jerusalem that besiegers are coming from a distant land and raise their voice against the cities of Yehuda. Like keepers of a field, they are against her all around. So they are going to besiege the land. He is warning them. He is seeing a vision. And when it gets into verse uh, 24, 25, 26, this is what he is seeing in that vision. He's like, I am seeing this happen in this vision. They are coming. They are going to besiege us. I see a vision. Announce to the nations, look, proclaim against Jerusalem that besiegers are coming from a distant land and raise their voice against the cities of Yehuda. Like keepers of a field, they are against her all around because she has rebelled against me, declares Yah. Your ways and your deeds have brought this upon you. Punished for your evil, rewarded for your good, they would have been able to stay in the land if only they would have obeyed. Your ways and your deeds have brought this upon you. And it's just so contrary, even as he speaks, to New Testament doctrine. That our ways and our deeds are brought upon Jesus Christ. There's no teaching like that in the Torah. You all suffer. We all suffer in this life. And the thing about Christianity also, and I've, I've talked with uh, preachers, they won't deny that we suffer in this life for the wrong that we do. How does that correlate? How does that connect? It does not connect. So continuing on. Your ways and your deeds have brought this upon you. This is your evil because it is bitter, because it has reached into your heart. So the evil was within them. And you think about also in Noah's day, it said the imagination of their heart was on the evil continually. We are getting there. We're getting there to where that's all people think about. Now, I believe it's from a, a series of events. And what I mean by that is people become bitter against other people when they've been done wrong. When people have been done wrong and people have suffered trauma in their lives, that is expressed to others because that's all they've ever experienced. And then what happens? We all turn against each other. It's a series of events. So my inward parts, your deeds, because it has reached into your heart. People have been done wrong in their lives and therefore they do wrong. Oh, my inward parts, my inward parts. I am in pain. Oh, the walls of my heart. And this is Jeremiah. My heart pounds in me. And you think about lamentations. He loved Jerusalem. He loved them. He said, my heart is pounding within me. My heart pounds in me. I am not silenced. Uh, silent for you have heard, oh my being, the sound of the ram's horn, the shout of battle. So he is seeing this vision. Destruction upon destruction is cried for all the land is ravaged. Suddenly my tents are ravaged, my curtains in a moment. He's like, it's just overtaking me. He's seeing this happen. How long shall I see a banner and hear the sound of the ram's horn? So that banner is Nas. It is something lifted up. So there is a warning. There is a standard. There's a signal. He's seeing this coming. A sign, a banner, a flagstaff. How long will I see this banner and hear the sound of the ram's horn? For my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are stupid children. 
They have no understanding. They are wise to do evil. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. So if you keep this in connection with what he's already talking about, he is seeing a vision. They are going to ravage Jerusalem. They are going to overtake Jerusalem. He is seeing this vision. And then you have, they don't know me. What does that mean? They don't know who I am. They have not experienced me. If we had a title for this message, and, and once you, you get this and you understand this, by the end of it, they know who he is. You have Pharaoh, and Pharaoh in the beginning says, who is Yah that I should obey him? And by the end of it, when all of Egypt is destroyed in the Reed Sea, Red Sea, whatever you want to say, by the end of it, they knew that who, who he was. They knew who Yah was. They no longer had to ask questions that Yah was the only one and there was no one beside him. So the title of this message would be, you don't know until you know. Crazy message. <laughs> you don't know until you know. Every single one of us goes through pain. Every single one of us has pain. I don't know your pain. I don't know your pain. You might be uh, experiencing pain from someone else who, who is experiencing pain. There is mental pain. There is physical pain. There is all kinds of pain in the world. And you know what? I don't know your pain and you don't know my pain. And by God, I would never wish upon anybody divorce and remarriage. Blended families. It's tough. You don't know my pain. I don't know your pain. But you know what? We can all relate. How? Because we all know what pain feels like. He said, they don't know me. They have not experienced me. But he says, at the very end of it, their deeds have caused these actions and they will know who I am. Everything in your life happens for a reason. Everything in your life is going to serve the purpose or the good of Yah's plan for you. Everything. So they were warned. Notice how in correlation he says, they're coming to besiege the land. I hear the ram's horn. I am afraid. My heart pounds within me. Uh, they are ravaged. How long will I warn these people? For my people are foolish. That word foolish is Avil. It is foolish, one who despises wisdom, one who mocks when guilty, the quarrelsome, the silly, the perverse. So my people are foolish. They are perverted. They have not known me. So what does that mean? He punishes the wicked. That's what that means. They don't know who I am. He rewards the righteous and he punishes the wicked. They don't know me. They're going to know me by the end of it. And when you think about after all is said and done, everyone's going to know Yah. They're all going to know him. And a part of that knowing him will be from him gathering Israel from the four corners of the earth and bringing them into the land. Every nation will see that. Everybody will know who Yah is and they will know that he is faithful. There will not be a single person saying who is Yah because everyone will teach his neighbor or because he will not have to teach his neighbor. Everyone's going to know. There's going to be no other gods. Something else they told me this week. I think I was listening to Hosea and uh, it said that they had made gods of sticks. And then I just see this image of Jesus Christ on a cross hanging there. That's their image. They bow down to it. Even though not all Christians follow the same doctrine as close, they all have the same origins. They may not bow down to the image of the man, but nevertheless, they follow the doctrine of the image of the man. So they still bow down to their false God. And I just think about that little stick. They had that stick and it's got him on it and they bow down to it. And I'm like, man. And you could show anybody and say, is this your God? That's their God. That's the image of their God. And they bow down to it. And that's why it's so important to know Torah, because Yah said specifically, you saw no image of me on the mountain. 
Therefore, do not make me in the image of a man or a woman or a beast, four-footed beast, creeping things, things in the sky, things in the water. That's not me. And what men have done is they've merged those things. Men with, you have a Kamosh, who I think is a mix between a fish and a man. And then you have all the uh, Egyptian gods who are what? Birds with man. You have this with man. So they have made images of gods. But that's not him. If you don't know Torah, you will be easily deceived. So how long shall I warn you? The people don't know me. They are wise to do evil. That evil, uh, they know they are wise. Uh, I wanted to get into the word no. They have not known me. That is to know, to perceive, discern. They have not learned to know me. But my favorite one is know by experience. They have not experienced me. Later, when we get into Psalms 34, have you tasted and seen that Yah's good? That is to know him. Through all the troubles in your life, I just think that Yah has delivered you from every single one of them. You may have troubles now, but he's faithful. He's still going to deliver you out of every one of your troubles. Every single one. You've got troubles today. You had troubles yesterday. You don't even remember what half of those troubles are. They're gone. He's faithful, no matter what. So, they are wise to do evil. So, to experience him, to know him by experience. And he's saying, after all this is said and done, they're going to know who I am. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. I looked at the earth. So this is Jeremiah. I looked at the earth and saw it was formless and empty and the Shemaim that had no light. I looked at the mountains and saw they shook and all the hills were swaying. I looked and saw there was no man and all the birds of the Shemaim had fled. I looked and saw the garden land was a wilderness and all its cities were broken down and the presence of Yah by his burning displeasure. For thus said Yah, all the earth shall be ruined, but I shall not make a complete end. On account of this, let the earth mourn and the Shemaim above be dark because I have spoken, because I have purposed and shall not relent, nor do I turn back from it. All the city is fleeing from the noise of the horsemen and bow archers. They shall go into bushes and climb up on rocks and all the city is forsaken and no one is dwelling in it. And when you are ravaged, what would you do? Though you put on crimson, though you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, though you enlarge your eyes with paint, you adorn yourself in vain. Your lovers despise you. They seek your life. Where are your idols? For I have heard a voice as of a woman in labor. The distress as of her who brings forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion. She bewails herself. She spreads out her hands saying, woe to me for my being faints because of the murderers. Woe, woe to me for my being faints hmm, because of the murderers. So to know him, let's go to Hosea 3. So Jason had been in Hosea and he went to Hosea 3 and there's a part in there about they will be without uh, house idols. And I think I kind of understand that now of what that really means. Teraphim. It is teraphim, but it also says house idols and it also says uh, if you look at that definition, it still says house idols. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about it here in a second. So you have Hosea 3, and we'll start there. So then Yah, verse 1, said to me, Go again, love a woman loved by a friend, and an adulteress according to the love of Yah of the children, for the children of Israel, though they are turning to other mighty ones and love their raisin cakes. So, he is making a correlation here, making a connection. That's the word of the day, correlation. So, so I bought her for myself for 15 pieces of silver and a lethic of barley. And I said to her, you are to remain with me many days. You are not to whore nor become an, any man's. And so I shall also be towards you. So you think about Gomer and then you think about Israel. They were living in adultery. Okay? And then when he bought them, he brought them out. That is what he is saying. You shall dwell with me and you shall be mine. That is how you make the connection with verse 4. 
For many days the children of Israel are to remain without sovereign and without prince and without slaughtering and without pillar and also without garment or house idols. That pillar is obelisk. Okay? So, what this means, let's make the connections here. You have, they're both adulterous. They have other lovers. Both of them. Other gods, other lovers. Now, he says, you shall purchase them and you shall remain with me. So, Gomer had protection from Hosea. Israel had protection from Yah. Now it makes sense with verse 4. Because he said, you are no longer going to have sovereign. You're not going to have prince. You can't go to the slaughtering. You're not going to have any of that. You're going to be without an obelisk. You can't go to your false idols. You can't go to your sh shoulder garment, which they said is also uh, the priestly garment. They said it could have been that or house idols. So what does all that have in agreement? What does all that mean? You're got, not going to have any savior but me. You're not going to have any slaughtering. You don't have to go for the blood offering. All that's going to be done away with. The Savior's done away with. The Prince is done away with. All your idols are done away with. And you're going to turn to me. Huh? The temple's gone now. Yeah, the temple's gone now. He says many days. They're out with it. They don't have it. They don't have a king. They don't have a prince. All their idols will be gone. And he said, you're going to depend on me. I'm going to be your Savior. Because that's the things that they were depending on. Afterwards, notice, the children of Israel shall return. So we are scattered. Okay. And he says, there's going to be a period in time when you don't have these things. You're going to get rid of your idols, your house idols. You're not going to be able to slaughter. You're not going to have a king. You're not going to have a prince. You're going to be in a desolate land and you're going to completely depend on me. And after that time, you're going to return. There we are. Here we are now. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek Yah, their Elohim, and David, their sovereign, and revere Yah and his goodness in the latter days. So that's the connection. Hosea, they will experience him. There will be no other savior. They will have nothing to go to. Jesus is their king. Jesus is their sacrifice. Jesus is their idol. He is taking that and wiping it away. Hosea 5 and 7. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. My esteem they have changed into shame. I'm not in the right one. Chapter 5. Sorry about that. So they have acted treacherously against Yah. For they have brought forth strange children. Now a new moon shall devour them with their portions. And I want to get you. All this in context because we've talked about this before and this is what's going to happen. Blow the ram's horn and give up the trumpet in Ramah. Shout, O Beth Awen, behind you, O Benjamin. Ephraim is laid waste in the day of rebuke among the tribes of Israel. I shall make known what is certain. The chiefs of Yehuda shall be like those who remove a border. On them I pour out my wrath like water. Ephraim is oppressed. Crushed in judgment because he walked after the command when it pleased him. So when, when it's convenient for him, he followed Yah. So I am to Ephraim, Ephraim, like a moth into a house of Judah, like rottenness. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Yehuda saw his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to the sovereign Yareb. And he is unable to heal you or to remove the wound from you. So that's what they did. They wanted to make a union. They wanted to make a covenant with Assyria to save them. I think they also uh, wanted to make that covenant with Egypt. And he's like, they're not going to save you. For I am like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Yehuda. I myself tear them and go. I take, a, take them away and there is no one to deliver. Where is your house idol? Where is your king? Where is your savior? He said there's going to be a three part. And that's what he talks about in Hosea. They are not my people. They are my people. I shall go. Notice. I shall go. I shall return to my place until they confess their guilt and seek my face in their distress diligently. Search for me. 
when it comes upon the whole earth and all idols and all kings and all kingdoms are destroyed, there's going to be nowhere else to go except to seek you through the distress, through the tribulation. So that's in Hosea. Do you know him? <laughs> have you experienced him in your life? If you have a covenant with him and a relationship with him, he promised you that he's never going to leave you. If you are obedient to him and you follow him, he is going to take care of you. I really do like in, um, in Ecclesiastes, it's one of my favorite verses. It says, we are lacking, uh, the world is lacking everything. I'd have to read it. Hold on. I know where it's at though. Can't find the book, but I know where it's at. Because uh, I don't want to misquote it. Verse 15, chapter 1, uh, Ecclesiastes, the crooked could not be straightened and what is lacking could not be counted. So, in your life, there, are, there could be a lot of things that are missing. This is missing, that is missing. That's what he's talking about. You've always got a need for something. There's always a need for something new. Uh, let's talk about the basics form of it, food, water. You always need food and water, shelter. Uh, your tire blows out. Your gas bill needs to be paid. There is, you cannot number the things that are lacking. But that's the difference in perception. Because you think about Psalms 23. Yah is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Okay? I believe that I'm satisfied with everything that I have. I lack nothing in my life. Because everything that I've ever needed, Yah has provided for me. There are some things that I didn't ask for in my life, and he still gave them to me. <laughs> he knew exactly what I needed in my life. He knew the challenges I needed in my life. He knew the struggles that I needed in my life. Everything was purposed by him, and he knew exactly what I needed. So therefore, instead of complaining about our lives or complaining about my life, just accept that he knew exactly what you needed at that specific time. Because he's in control. Satan's not in control. There is no Satan. Yah is in control of all things. So, the things that are lacking cannot be counted. But if you have Yah, he takes care of you. There is nothing that you lack. Proverbs 24. So the whole sum of the message is you don't know until you know. So what does that mean? We all have pain. We all have suffering. We all have events in our lives, every single one, and we can relate through the pain. We can relate through the struggle. Your pain is not my pain, but that does not mean that I don't hurt. And that does not mean that you don't hurt because of the things that you've experienced. Proverbs 24. I really want you to get something out of this because of what he showed me in it. One of my favorite verses, and we'll talk about that when we get to it. So Proverbs 24 and 10. If you falter, in, one of my favorite verses is this one. If you falter in the day of distress, your strength is small. So don't give up when challenging times come upon you. Don't faint. Don't give up. Don't cast it off. Don't throw in the towel. That's what that faint means. Uh, if you do give up, your strength is small. Deliver those taken to death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, see, we did not know. So if you see some that are about to be taken by death and stumbling to the slaughter, or uh, they're about to be taken over. If you say, see, we did not know this. I didn't know that they were about to die or I didn't know that they were about to be killed. If you say, See, we did not know this. Would not he who weighs the hearts discern it? He knew that you knew and you did nothing about it. Would not he who weighs the hearts discern it? Talking about taking action. I just watched a video that was pretty good about our brains 
and the psychologi uh, psychology of our brains. Our brains want to protect us in trouble, okay? So that's where you get, uh, I think, I'm not going to say what that word is because I don't remember what it is because uh, I don't want to say the wrong thing. But anyway, fight or flight, that's how we can describe it. Uh, I think it's called epinephrine, but don't hold me to that. Uh, so fight or flight. When you get in a stressful situation, there are two things that you want to do. You either want to run or you want to attack. Okay? And your body and your brain is governed in a way that it wants to protect you. Okay? But you can override that. So there comes a point when you feel peace, and that is when the epinephrine is no longer running through your veins, and you feel that peace and comfort because you feel like the stress is no longer there. There is a way that you can override that fear. Say that you're laying in bed, and I've done this a million times, okay? I'm a snoozer. What does that mean? That means I'll hit snooze about five times because I'm just lazy and I don't want to take action. Count backwards from five. Five, four, three, two, one. And when you do that, your brain kicks into gear and you take action. You can't count forward because you can count Continuously, <laughs> if you want to do something and you're worried about what, uh, what might happen, if there's fear and anxiety, fight or flight, you don't want to do it, but you know that you need to do it, count backwards from five and you'll do it because it kicks that part in your brain. Uh, there's worry here and uh, the prefrontal cortex is what it's called. It's the, the part of your brain that wants to take action. So if you're worried about it, count backwards from five. It works. <laughs> Count backwards from five, and it'll move it from the worry into take action. So that's the way our brain is wired. It wants to protect you, but you can override that from that fear and take action. Because we all procrastinate. We're all procrastinators. But sometimes we do need to take action. And that's why... He connected that with this. If you say, we did not know this, because his brain convinced him that I don't need to take action. Uh, if you say, see, we did not know this, would not he who weighs the hearts discern it? He knew that you knew, and you didn't do anything about it. He who watches over your life, would he not know it? And shall he not repay man according to his works? So if you knew and did nothing, he's going to repay you for that. Okay? And he shall not, uh, and shall he not repay a man according to his work? My son, eat honey for it is good, and the honeycomb sweet to your taste. Know that wisdom is thus to your being. So wisdom is sweet, but he makes a connection here between wisdom and failure. Wisdom is good. Uh, know that wisdom is thus to your being. It is sweet to the taste, just as the honeycomb. If you have found it, there is a future, and your expect uh, expectancy is not cut off. Do not lie in wait, O wicked, against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not ravage his resting place. For seven times a righteous man falls, and he rises. But the wicked stumbles into evil. Do we see how wisdom and failure are connected? A righteous man falls seven times and does not give up. Wisdom is good to the man that takes it. It's through failure. That falls. Um, first off, the faint. The faint is do not, uh, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. That is sink. If you relax, if you become disheartened, if you abandon, if you just give up, your strength is small. And then you have the fall. That is not fall. It is to fall, it is to cast down. The righteous man is cast down seven times. The righteous man fails seven times. The righteous man is attacked seven times. The righteous man is slain seven times. He is smitten. He is overwhelmed seven times. That is failure. The righteous man fails seven times and still gets up. That's the difference between the righteous and the wicked because the wicked, what? What does he say? The wicked stumbles into evil. He's going to fall at it. Trouble is what that evil is. So wisdom and failure 
are both connected. Notice, though, you gain, and if you look at the definition of wisdom, chachma, wisdom is skill. The only way that you gain skill is through experience. You've got to put your hand to the planer <laughs> or whatever that you're experiencing in order to gain the skill. So therefore, wisdom comes through failure. If you never failed, and I think my dad said that, if you never failed, you ain't never learned nothing. So, notice how this is associated with pain. Pain and hurt. He falls. When you fall, it hurts. <laughs> it hurts. I know a lot of, I don't know what people think about skateboarding, but <laughs> if you're trying something and you fall, you can either get up or you can try it again. And that's what I've learned from skateboarding. You can either quit or try again because you're going to fall. But depending on how much you want that, you're going to try again and try again until you get it. Notice how wisdom is associated with pain. And you see that in all of Ecclesiastes. If, if I learn anything from Solomon, he learned a lot of what he knew. And no wonder he wrote Proverbs, but he learned a lot of what he knew through experience. Read Ecclesiastes. I did this, and I did that. And I did that, and I did that. And I did this, and I did that. And this is what I learned from all of that. From experience. But... Failure is just a part of learning. You don't know until you know. <laughs> we all have hurt. We all have pain, whether it's physical or mental. Maybe we're uh, personally suffering, or maybe someone that we love is personally suffering, whether physical or mental. We are all touched in some way or form with suffering. We all know pain, though it may come in a different form. We can all associate with the fall. Notice how wisdom, skill, is linked to the pain of failure. A righteous man falls seven times and is never cast out. Experience is what we have learned. Uh, Torah is more about the journey in your life and less about the end result. You think about, um, of course, Messiah is taught about in Tanakh and Torah, but that's not the whole purpose of, of Tanakh and Torah. The whole purpose of New Testament is Jesus Christ, but that's not the whole purpose and the thought of Tanakh. The whole purpose and thought of Tanakh is you and your relationship with Yah. That's the whole focus. Leviticus 19 It was Yah and his relationship with Israel. It wasn't about the coming of Messiah. It wasn't about the coming of Messiah to die on the cross for your sins. It was about Yah and his relationship with his people, period. Leviticus 19. It was the experience that they gained. Leviticus 19 and 33. And when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, do not oppress them. That is also vex. Now, continuing on, let the stranger who dwells among you be to you as the native among you. So like if they were born among you and you shall love him as yourself. Now notice, for you were strangers in the land of Mitzrayim. I am Yah, your Elohim. Can you imagine what it would be like to be a stranger in a different land? Now, even if we were to go over to Israel, and we think that Israel is our homeland, and we believe that, that we are Yah's people, they are still way different than we are. We're little old Southerners. We like cornbread and green beans. What I'm telling you is people are different. People are different. And what he is trying to get across to us through this scripture is relation. Is relating. He said, remember the stranger, love them like they're your own, because 
you were a stranger. He said, you knew what it was like. Treat them like they were born among you. Now, on the other side of that, he still says, do no unrighteousness and right ruling. So even though they are to be as you are and to be one with you, treat them like your brother and your sister, he said, still do no unrighteousness and right ruling in measurement of length and weight or in measurement of liquids. Have right scales, right weights, a right ephah, and a right hen. I am Yah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim. You shall guard all my laws and all my right rulings and do them. I am Yah. He is trying to get us to relate through something that we have experienced. Psalms 34, and we'll close out. We'll read all of this. He's trying to get them to relate. This is where you were, and that was you. Psalms 34, and we'll all get through this. So, um, Pharaoh had the opportunity to repent. Okay? Pharaoh had the opportunity to repent. <laughs> Funny. Falafel and hummus. Oh, that's good. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> Cornbread is down. That's hilarious. Okay. So, um, <laughs> oh my goodness. So Pharaoh had an opportunity to repent. His heart was hardened through all of that. And I told you, and I believe uh, that is an indirect hardening just because of who Yah was. Okay. Yah was Elohim, uh, creator of all. And this God man uh, thought that he was God in the flesh, the one who controlled the Nile. Uh, was fighting against God. So Pharaoh had an opportunity many times to repent. It was not unjust for Yah to destroy him and all the Egyptians. Okay, So there is always an opportunity to know Yah. That opportunity is always there. You think of all of the miracles that Pharaoh saw and his heart was still hard towards Yah even though he knew him. He knew him. He knew who he was. And he had the opportunity to repent and turn back. So, sometimes we experience Yah and it's, it's not to our favor. We don't think that we deserve that or whatever. You think about Pharaoh. Pharaoh experienced who Yah was. It's all about perception. How you see it. Do you see it as a negative thing? Or do you see it as a positive thing? All the trouble in your life. I tell you, I deserved everything that I got. I deserved every bit of it. Every trouble that I got into, I deserved every bit of it, and I learned something from it. Every bit of it. I probably didn't understand at the time, but when I look back, I got it. And I was like, thank you for that. You were protecting me. You knew exactly what was going on. You knew more than I did. And then that just <laughs> mends the relationship that I have with Yah. It makes it even greater, the relationship that I have with Yah. Know him. Have you experienced him in your life? That he is controlling it all. He's got it all in his hands. He's got a plan for all of it. Psalms 34. Of David, David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed... I barak Yah at all times. His praise is continually in my mouth. My being shall boast in Yah. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, make Yah great with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought Yah and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor one cried out and Yah heard him. And saved him out of all his distresses. The messenger of Yah encamps all around those who revere him and rescues them. Oh, taste and see that Yah is good. If you have tasted something, I like spice cake, okay? I have experienced that taste. I know what that's like. Same concept here. Have you experienced Yah in your life? Have you seen that he is good? Like spice cake. <laughs> okay, not exactly like that. But I'm trying to get you 
to relate and understand. And I think that's also why when you look through Proverbs, it talks about the coney. You look at, which I think is a badger. Uh, if you thought through Psalms, it talks about the roe and the heart. And I think those are types of like antelope and deer. Uh, so he relates with things that we see and things that we experience. And we have really got far away from who Yah is because Yah is not in the cell phone and he's not in the TV. Yah is in the wilderness. Yah is out in the woods. Yah is out in the desert. Yah is out at the sunrise. Yah is out at the sunset. Yah is out in the ice on the trees. Yah is everywhere. And we have lost the perception of who he is because we have not seen his wonderful works. When you go outside and you feel the breeze, that's Yah. We have lost who he is because we have not experienced him. Because we're so we're stuck in the house. When it's cold outside, and I don't blame you right now if you are, but go outside and check and see Yah's magnificent wonders. We've lost that. We've lost touch with Yah because we don't see his creation. So that's why he, he tries to get you to relate through things that you see, things that you experience. It's like this. Oh, I've seen that before. It's like this. So if you want to see Yah, look at nature, look at animals. That's where Yah is in his creation. Taste and see that Yah is good. Baruch is the man that takes refuge in him. Revere Yah, you his set apart ones, for there is no lack to them who revere him. Young lions have lacked and been hungry, but those who seek Yah lack not any goodness. Come, you children, listen to me. Let me teach you the reverence of Yah. Here it is. Who is the man that desires life and loves many days in order to see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So that's what I've talked about before. We did that message about you can speak evil and you can do evil. So watch what you say and watch what you do. Turn away from evil and do good. He said, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit or deception. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of Yah are on the righteous and his ears unto their cry. The face of Yah is against evildoers to cut off their remembrance from the earth. Crying out and Yah heard and delivered them out of all their distress. There you go. Yah is near to the brokenhearted and saves those whose spirit is crushed. Many are the evils of the righteous or troubles, but Yah delivers him out of them all. Every single one. He who is guarding all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil slays the wicked, trouble. And those who hate the righteous are guilty. Yah redeems the life of his servants, and none of those taking refuge in him are guilty. So, we can all relate. We all have experienced pain. The righteous man falls seven times. That is the pain of failure. But he rises up again. That is the difference. That is the difference. That is success. Uh, if you see, and I, I, I like giving keys uh, to happiness. The key, One of the keys to happiness is just thankfulness. It's just thankfulness. Being thankful. But if you're bitter and you envy and you're covetous and you want everything that everybody else has, no wonder you're never going to be happy. Be thankful for what you have. And if your next door neighbor has a hot rod, maybe he'll let you drive it. I don't know. Just be thankful that he's got it. That's cool that that person has that. That's great that that person, I'm happy for you. That's where happiness comes from. It's just thankfulness. I'm thankful for the things that I've got. I've got a warm house. I've got transportation. I've got food. Be happy. So we can all relate. You don't know until you know. And the pain that I've suffered, I, wouldn't, uh, I would not put that on any of my enemies. You don't know what I've gone through. I don't know what you've gone through. But nevertheless, we can all relate because we know what pain feels like, whether physical or mental, or whether that we are experiencing it through someone else that we care about. Let's relate. We're so separate. We're so divided. We're so in our own world. A lot of times we forget about the pain of others. Yah's good. He's too good. <laughs>
Everybody have a blessed Sabbath. Baruch Hashem. Hallelujah. Amen.